morning and God bless you. Today it is my honor to welcome you back to Love Gospel Assembly's Nuggets of Hope. Today we'll be continuing the topic of the voice of the prophets. Um, and today I'll be speaking about the prophet Amos. Now Amos is a prophet who I believe answers some very tough questions for us as a body and believers about how involved should we be in calling out injustice and calling out the things that we see in the world around us. Uh, in the book of Amos, we see God use the prophet to oppose injustice, to speak in defense of the poor, and to call out the greed and the hypocrisy of those in power. Uh, Amos spoke against the many sins committed in Israel and Judah, as well as their surrounding nations. We don't know much about Amos' origins. Uh, he doesn't say too much himself. Amos was from a small town a few miles from the Dead Sea named Tekoa in the kingdom of Judah. He was not a prophet by lineage or education. Uh, in fact, in Amos 7, 14 and 15, he says, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd. And I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. And you know, when he accepted God's desire for his life, God did take him and God sent him from Judah to Israel, where he brought the word of the Lord to the people at the royal sanctuary in Bethel. Now this royal sanctuary was built by King Jeroboam the first, uh, the first king of the newly divided northern kingdom of Israel. Jeroboam was a very corrupt man who uh, had a great hatred for the line of David. Um, he built these sanctuaries as a way to sway people from God because he knew in doing so they would not honor the line of David. Uh, in each of these sanctuaries he placed a golden calf just like the ones built during the, the exodus from Egypt to the promised land. and. Uh, he placed them there and said that these people would worship them instead. Uh, so by the time Amos came forth with his prophecies and his warnings, these golden calves had been in these temples for about 150 years. Um, and during the time of Amos, there was also the time of the prophets Isaiah and Hosea. You know, the three prophets were contemporaries and in a way uh, teammates almost. Now Amos was used by God to speak first to the many evils perpetrated by the enemies of Israel and their sinful ways. He appears to them almost like a prosecutor in a court of law, explaining in an almost poetic way the many charges against them. He opens his book with a foreboding declaration. The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of the camel withers. From here, he begins to present the charges using a sort of anaphora, a repeated phrase for three sins and even for four. In biblical numerology, three is the number of harmony or completeness, much like seven. You know, you can think of the Trinity, uh, the three days in the tomb, or, you know, the three crosses on Mount Calvary, and so on. Uh, three represents completion. Uh, but, you know, um, for him to say for three, and even for four, is for him to really speak to the overabundance of sin um, in these nations at the time. And overabundance is a theme that you see repeated in the book of Amos. There's, um, you know, the great wealth that the upper class was hoarding, the great number of injustices going on at the time, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so you, you do see that theme of overabundance repeated. And as you read the scriptures, you'll also notice that none of these nations are really charged for more than one or two crimes. Uh, but still, the weight of their sin was so strong that it was as if they were being judged not just for three, but also for four. Um, so Amos initially charges seven nations of uh, seven nations of committing specific crimes, um, specifically acts of cruelty in wartime, uh, such as the establishment of a slave trade. You know they were um, raiding communities in Israel and taking up entire families as slaves and selling them to neighboring nations, and also just betraying their alliances that they had had with Israel. Uh, the first six nations he names are Damascus. Gaza or Egypt, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Now Moab he actually accuses of desecrating the remains of the king of Edom. So we see that not only are they being charged for their crimes against Israel, but also their crimes against each other, the, way this, the ways that they've dishonored each other. So then um, he then charges Judah with the crime of apostasy, you know, turning away from God and worshiping false idols. Uh, the verdict for all seven of these nations is effectively the same that God is coming forth to destroy them and remove them from the earth. And you know, for the people in Israel at the time, this was great news. God is finally coming forth to, uh, to rid them of their enemies and to render the judgment that they've earned. But then this is when we see the theme of overabundance come back in. Uh, Amos charges not only seven nations, but he charges an eighth, which is Israel. 
Now Israel, he charges with more crimes than the last few. Um, he charges them once again of exploitation, apathy towards the poor, drunkenness, sexual perversion. Uh, you know, he tells them that they were morally corrupt. Uh, Don Fleming in the Bridgeway Bible Commentary describes some of what was going on at the time. He says, the wealthy would seize the clothes of the poor as guarantees for repayment of debts, even though the law of Moses prohibited the seizure of clothes and other essential items as guarantees. We see this in Deuteronomy 24. But since the wealthy have no desire to wear the clothes of the poor, they find an alternative use for them. They spread them out besides the ball altars to make beds where they engage in sexual rites with religious prostitutes. Their religious feasts became drinking parties, but again the wine comes from people who have been exploited. Corrupt officials place unjust fines on poor people such as farmers. Then, when the farmers are unable to pay their fines, the officials seize their wine as payments. See, they would perpetrate this cycle of debt and um, thievery almost and keep them in that cycle of debt. The remainder of his writings are dedicated to pleading with Israel to repent for their many sins um, and calling out their lack of concern towards their sins. He's warning them that God is aware and is preparing to render great judgment upon them. As his ministry continues, you can see his frustration beginning to build. He starts to call out groups. He starts to call out the wives of the wealthy men. He calls them cows of Bashan. He also, you know, begins to call out the complacent, those who see what's going on and don't feel the need to repent. Um, and then he mocks those who have been proclaiming for the day of the Lord, who, you know, believe that this is the day that God will restore Israel. But he tells them, no, this is the day that God is coming to judge you. Don't look forward to this day. You need to repent first. You know, in chapter 7, God shows Amos three visions of the impending doom. The first is a swarm of locusts, which he pleads with God not to send forth, and God relents. The second of a great fire, which he once again pleads with God not to send, and God relents. But the final vision is of a plumb line, which was a tool used to determine whether or not a wall was straight, and if it determined that a wall was not straight, the wall would have to be destroyed. God tells him in Amos 7 and 8, Look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. That wall is being torn down. By this point, he is rebuked by Amaziah, the priest at Bethel, under the orders of the king of the time, Jeroboam II, a descendant of Jeroboam I, of course, and told to return to Judah. Amos then prophesied that for, the sin, that for their sins, and for their ignorance, rather, God has finally given him a verdict. That because of this, the priest and the king, because of their ignorance, Israel will fall to a pagan nation. This is a prophecy that would be fulfilled about 30 years later by the Assyrians, which of course led to the Babylonian exile. After this, he's given the fourth vision of a basket of ripe fruit. And God explains to him that this basket of ripe fruit is Israel and that the time of judgment is coming for them. Finally, in chapter nine, Amos warns him that the coming judgment, you know, it's unavoidable, that this is set in stone. God is getting ready to wipe you from the earth. But then he also offers them hope. He tells them that God is going to sift out the righteous from the unrepentant and that a remnant will remain and that he will use them to restore David's fallen shelter and that in them and through them he will rebuild Israel never to be ruined again. This prophecy is a direct parallel to the second coming of Christ in the same hope and the same prophecy that we've been waiting on and that we built our churches on. You see, despite what some people may think, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same God. His thoughts have not changed. His love for us has not changed. His ways, his ways, though we know only so much of them are, are consistent back to forth. God's will for us has never changed. But just like those before us, God will come forth to render judgment we have a hope in Christ and, and an arbitrator, you know, who speaks to God for us. And that's where we find our faith in. But you know that that's what God established for us. And that's just what we find in God. That's his love for us. That's his mercy. And, you know, that is his heart. That he would give us something that we didn't earn and that we didn't deserve. You know, and he offered it to them as, uh, you know, just a blessing of his grace and he continues to offer that to us. Um, so, you know, I guess it begs the question, like how now, knowing what we know Amos went through and knowing what we know was the issue at the time, can we refuse to repent? 
Amos spoke not to just the sinners at the time, but also to the complacent, those who knew better and would not repent for their ways. We have our own ways about us as believers that we know we need to let go of, that we know we need to repent of, but that we refuse to do it. I'm as guilty as anybody. <laughs> uh, so, you know, in Amos, we find not just to call out injustice, but to examine ourselves and just to be proactive in examining the areas of our lives that God wants us to clean house in. Uh, and lastly, you know, the word does ring true today because as believers, we all sit in the same seat that he did. Uh, the sins that transpired in Bethel, you know, we see all around us, especially those of us who live in New York. We see these injustices every day. We see um, the needy, the poor. Uh, we see this every day. We see this every day. And it is our calling to be their advocates. It is our calling to call for fair treatment of them. Our gospel is a social gospel, as Amos has shown us in you know, Amos was a shepherd who could have stayed in Tekoa, but he heard the call of God and he answered. And that's all God wants for many of us to hear his call and to answer. So in that, I hope you've been encouraged and you just understand that though this path may be narrow and though it may be sometimes a little lonely, sometimes difficult, sometimes isolating, that there are men and women in faith who have stepped before us and we follow in their footsteps, all for the glory of God, that he may use us as he used them. So take the time to find that Amos in you <laughs> and be blessed and go where God leads you. Amen. Thank you for joining us in this week's Nuggets of Hope. We hope you continue to join us and we hope that you are blessed by each teaching. You can join us on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. God bless you.